Hello! Welcome to the 1455 author series, a virtual portal into the minds of writers that explores their latest work, inspirations, and more. I'm Brittany Corrigan. I'm a poet from Portland, Oregon, um, and I'm going to be reading to you today from um, my collection, Solastalgia, which was out from Jack Lake Press this past summer, and talking to you more about um, the inspiration behind this book. So. Um, Solastalgia uh, is a word, a fairly recent word, that was coined by the philosopher Glenn Albrecht around 2009, and it means like a homesickness for the home that you're already in, or a distress around environmental change. And it's come to mean more recently um, this existential distress um, caused by climate change, um, and so folks are using it in the um, in the climate change um, awareness movement and um, and uh, I consider this book eco poetry which is I think a poetry of witness about the environment and the state of our planet and hopefully uh, what we can do to help um, mitigate some of the damage that we've done so I started writing this book during the pandemic um, and I was one of those uh, folks who actually sort of thrived during that time. Um, I consider myself very lucky because of that. Um, I had good support and a job I could keep um, and more time on my hands. And um, it allowed me time to do some deep thinking about these issues. Um, I've always been interested in science and nature and um, climate activism and, um, and animals in particular. And um, so I really did a deep dive into that, um, into those issues and things that I wanted to say about that. And so a lot of these poems in this, the book, some of them are um, sort of imagining um, what the world would be like without us. Some of them are really looking hard at the damage we've already done. Some of them are um, celebrating various endangered species and trying to bring awareness to the sixth extinction. So there's a large variety uh, in here of, of types of poetry that I was uh, interested in exploring. So. Um, and then uh, I wrote it over a period of a couple years, and um, I, uh, and as part of what I used to help me write it, I had written about half the poems, and um, and then um, decided that I really wanted to make this into a, a full manuscript, a full book, and I used. Um, I'm part of a, a group that. M Every December, uh, this group of poets gets together and we write together virtually um, and post our drafts um, to a blog together that we read and, and provide encouragement to each other. Um, and it's something I look forward to every year and really helps get my writing going. Um, and so I used that time and then a series of prompts from the wonderful small press to Sylvia's Press. Um, every December they do a poetry advent calendar um, where you can pay a small amount of money, which goes to support the press and they'll send you a writing prompt um, every day and I decided that I was going to use those prompts to help me finish this book and no matter what the prompt was I was going to make it fit my subject matter and so I think that allowed me to get to um, some some material and some ideas that I, I from a really different approach than I normally would have and so some of the poems in this book surprised even me uh, as I think they wouldn't have come to, fr to fruition without those prompts. So that's a little background on the book, and I want to give you um, a few poems from the book to, to, um, to showcase some of the different aspects of it, and then I'll talk a little bit more about my writing process. So, um, so I'm going to start out with what I call one of these uh, World Without Us poems, really imagining um, what it might be like after our species is gone and um, nature takes back over. So this is called The Strip Mall Changes Its Mind. At first, it took comfort in the scents from body beyond. Floral powders and cinnamon lotions mingled in the stuffy dim. It watched over so many unfooted shoes. Bright dresses called out in bold prints to suits in the dry cleaner's rack, still rows of ghosts. Then the grief set in. The conveyor belt of Sushi Town twisted like an empty gut. Its capillaries of people gone, quiet at the heart. Undone, it hardly noticed windows shattering, walls crumbling as trees limbed their way in. Sunlight on every rain-warped floor. Missing the humans with their electric bodies. Wires and pipes spilled out between unmoved beams. 
tireless beaks bored holes in everything. But the moss was so soft, it made the unframing bearable. Signs unlatched, bedded down in tendrilled leaves. When the fox moved in, birthed two russet kits in a thicketed shopping cart, wind like a breath, a sigh, rose past the splintered rafters, the unlit lights. And so it happened, the forgetting, painless its tender reclaiming, dangling ceiling tiles, sloppy with stars. And next I'm going to read you, there's a whole series of what I call my unloved animals poems. And I will say not unloved by me and hopefully not unloved by you by the time um, I'm done and by the time you've read these poems. So I'm going to read one of those. This is called Canis. You think you want the puffball pooch for your lap or the gentle giant that lets toddlers pull its ears or the hound trained to bring back limp birds in its mouth, refusing instinct, whistle-whipped, gorged on praise. But the slender beast that roams your streets at dawn and dusk has walked this ground a million years. When wolves and jackals land bridged their way out, coyote stayed, survived the poisons, bullets fired from planes. Misunderstood, coyote knows your nature. Slides between cars, its muzzle full of mice. Come now, doesn't your heart wish to trot down darkened sidewalks? Outwit what has clobbered it? Yip and howl at every streetlight moon. Here, come stand at the window. Watch the yellow eyes, ears that swivel toward the city's hum. This is the dog you've always wanted, the one that turns city to wildscape, stops you in your tracks, unguards your door. All right, so um, next I'm going to read you a poem called Carpe Diem. Forget the day. How hours flatten the way rising water turns islands back to sea. How minutes tire of treading and flail their tentacled fingers above the surface, grasping at gull legs, the mired rim of a trash fork hex, anything to hold on to before seconds turn blue from the effort and the whole mess siphons down. Yes, forget the day. In terms of this planet, a planet that has been here 4.5 billion years, our existence but a fraction of a percent, a blip even to the dinosaurs that tromped and scrabbled themselves across the Earth's crust 159 million years longer than we've been digging our toes in the sand, swinging from branches, praising the soil, or stewarding the land, or unrocking the mountains, or replacing redwoods with skyscrapers, or talking about the weather, or generally screwing everything up. Yes, this isn't about the day anymore. It's about reach out and grab that ice shelf. Don't let that big white bear and her two black-eyed cubs float away. Carpe Ursus Maritimus, Carpe Pongo Abeli, orangutans grooming their 97% identical to human genome selves in the rainforest. Please, Carpe the Rainforests. Carpe Panthera Pardis Orientalis, Carpe Panthera Tigris Sundiaca, big cats in their patterned fur coats, in their slink vanishing away from us. Carpe Balanoptera Musculus, whale shark circling our dreams, vesseling its way through our paintings and poems. Carpe Thaumatibus Gigantian, giant ibis, the world's most endangered and evolutionarily distinct bird. Carpe Adalaska Anops, Kawai cave wolf spider that doesn't spin webs, that chases down its prey the way we are chasing our own tails now, digging ourselves a meteor-sized crater of a grave, exponentially expanding daily what we'll take down with us, dragging the aurora borealis and its tundra and permafrost after us. Yes, forget the day. Carpe, the last of the dark sky places, the quietest places on earth. 
the deserts with their nocturnal rhythms, flora and fauna that know what it is to survive. Yes, forget the day. Carpe noctis, carpe noctis. Let there be stars when we seize the last of the light. So throughout this book, there's a series of what I call the Anthrop Anthropocene Blessings. And um, these are a series of short poems about a variety of endangered species, both plants and animals. And they're meant to be um, a celebration of those animals, um, as well as um, really bringing awareness to their fate. So um, this is Anthropocene Blessing, California Condor. King of Birds. You of the nine foot wingspan, you who glide for hours on currents of air without a single beat, thousands of feet above the leaden earth. Scavenger ancestor, only surviving member of your genus, longest lived. May you feast on the flesh of the dead as you toss their spirits up to the sky. May the carrion ghosts look down upon your unplumaged head, your black feathered sacred form, and be healed of all that stalked them in this world. May you be not poisoned by our buckshot, seething in each carcass we leave behind. May you outgrow our captivity to hatch your single eggs in mountain cliff caves, giant redwood trees. New world vulture, May your bulbous, wrinkled visage remember how you soared over mammoths. May you be revered as virtuous, as rising back from the brink, as gathering your flock around the fallen. May you take death in your mouth and find it sweet. Find that it sustains. And I'm gonna read you one last poem. Um, there's a lot of darkness uh, in these poems, and I, um, when I read to people, um, I think um, it's important that we sit with that darkness and take responsibility for that darkness. Um, but I also um, feel that um, I wanted to give a thread of hope to this book as well, because I think there, um, there, is still things, there are still things we can do. So I'm going to leave you with this poem, Miraculous. When all the news is bad or worse, my ears ringing like a din of night insects just swelter and drone, I quiet my bones with the thought of quaking aspen. Trembling giant, grove of thousands of trees, all with a single system of roots. A million years old, bright fluttering of gold against blue. And when I think I can't take in another sorrow, each a stone stacked up like a cairn on my heart. I remember how the jaws of a snake unhinge. Its mouth opens and opens to enfold what's impossibly large, patient swallowing followed by a length of rest. And when what we've done can't be undone, hope just a speck on the future's woolly back. I jumpstart my wonder with this. The snow in Antarctica is sprinkled with the dust of ancient stars. While we hunted and gathered, the galaxy glittered and lay itself down in our light. So those are poems from Solastalgia from Jack Lake Press. Um, so I'm just gonna talk to you uh, for a few minutes here about um, me as a writer and my writing process. So. Um, in terms of a writing routine, um, that is actually not something I really have. Um, I try to, um, I don't write daily, um, but I feel like I'm doing something to feed my writer brain daily. Um, so I have a full-time job, <laughs> I have kids, um, I have lots of other commitments, but I feel like I like to keep writing central to my life, even if I don't have the time to put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard <laughs> every day, that I'm doing something that feeds my literary spirit. So. Um, that might look like um, something, a practice I've done um, since 
I think to around 2007, is that every day I share a poem on my Facebook page, a poem not by me, but by somebody else that keeps me reading poetry every morning to choose something that I'd like to share with people. So that's a really important part of my sort of daily routine. Um, I do a lot of reading, not just of poetry, but I also love fiction, um, particularly short stories. And I read some nonfiction and sort of science related um, work as well. Um, and then engaging with other with other writers. So I'm in a couple of writing groups, one for my poetry, one for my fiction. So I'm always reading other people's work and um, critiquing it and thinking deeply about it. And so all of those things together, even if I'm not generating new work or revising work every day, are something that make me feel every day that that I'm a writer and I'm doing and I'm doing this work and I'm creating this art. Um, so um, so that's what I do when I and I tend to. Um, work, I do tend to work sort of project based. So um, sort of in between manuscripts right now, since this book just came out, um, but I tend to focus on a, an interest and really write a project towards that interest. And so the this one was all eco poetry. The book before this um, was a book called Daughters um, with Airly Press. And it's a series of persona poems and the voices of daughters from various um, mythology and folklore and popular culture. And so that was a really immersive project that had a variety of topics, but all sort of on a single theme. Um, I wrote a, a little chapbook that was all poems that were in response to events in the news, current events. And so I do tend to, tend to sort of be project based. Um, and um, I have a few interests right now that I'm playing around with that may turn into a next book. I'm super interested in um, wildlife crossings and road ecology. So I've written a series of poems about that. I've been writing a series of poems about NASA missions and space. Um, so things that just draw my interest. Um, and then I, I tend to, you know, write and write and write about them from, from different angles. Um, so in terms of um, writer's block, so um, I'm not sure if I necessarily believe in writer's block, but I definitely go through slumps. I definitely go through times where I don't feel as inspired or I, I don't feel like I, I know what I want to write about or um, I'm kind of, a, yeah, a little bit stuck. Um, things I use to help me get out of that. Um, I do like um, prompts and so I will use prompts and I tend to not um, be real strict about them and having to follow them exactly, but I use them as sort of a jumping off point. And so I will use prompts from, from various places to help me get started. Um, I do a lot of reading. So reading other people's work and engaging in conversations about that work is something that, that kickstarts my writing as well. Um, so, uh, and then also just reading about things that interest me. So um, I keep a document of articles I run across, stories, um, things that sort of piqued my interest. Um, and I just dump all the, all the links or ideas into a big document um, so that when I am stuck, um, I can go through it and be like, oh yeah, I wanted to, to write about that thing that I read about. And that helps me get going as well. Um, so in terms of my uh, creative personal inspirations or folks that I'm inspired by, so um, as uh, a young writer, um, I uh, started with really loving some of the um, sort of confessional poetry. Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton and Sharon Olds um, were big influences on me. Um, when I was in college, I really loved work by Naomi Shihab Nye, which I still do, um, and Joy Harjo. Um, more recently, poets I've really been drawn to um, are Ada Lamone, our current poet laureate, um, Ross Gay, um, Amy Nezakamatatil, um, some of these poets who I feel are um, are not only able to deal with difficult subject matter, but also really infuse joy and wonder into that work. And that's something I really admire because I felt like when I was a young poet that I um, I've, I've had a lucky life and I feel like um, I didn't I didn't know what to write about sometimes because I felt like I didn't have enough I didn't have enough pain of course we've all had pain but I feel like pain is important to write about um, but so is joy and so I really appreciate those poets for their ability to to celebrate um, as well as to um, to really examine some some difficult subject matter so um, how I've developed my literary career. So I've been, um, I've been writing since I was a little kid, but I've been writing really seriously, um, I think really since college. Um, so for the past, you know, 30 some odd years. 
and um, I developed my career by by writing by joining writing groups and engaging with other writers by taking workshops I feel like I always have something to learn it doesn't matter how many books I've published I still have something to learn from from other writers and teachers um, and uh, I, you know, started sending work out to journals, you know, early on when I was a teenager and into my early 20s. And so um, the more I send out, the more I engage with, with small presses and small journals um, by going to lots of readings and literary events, um, now both online and in person, to really experience the work of others and learn from them um, and be in conversation with them with my work as well. I love doing group readings and reading with other poets and seeing how our, our poetry talks to each other. Um, so I do a lot of that. Uh, and then supporting my local bookstores, <laughs> local independent bookstores, I think is really important. And um, all of those connections have helped me develop my career as a writer in terms of who I've met um, and engaged with and presses I've come into contact with that, that then um, allowed me to expand um, not only my own, my own work, but getting my work out into the world to, to other readers. Um, so this particular book, um, this is my fifth collection, and um, I did the, the regular routine, I think, that a lot of um, poets with their manuscripts do, which is sending it out to a lot of book contests and open reading periods for small presses. I really adore small presses, and I'm very happy to, be, to have my work published with them. Um, so this book made, made those rounds. Um, and it finally ended up, I discovered Jack Lake Press, which is a press I didn't know much about, but I had some friends who, was, who were starting to publish with them. Um, they had an open reading period where they, they took like a sample of the book, not even the whole manuscript. And if they like it, they ask for more. And so that's what I did. And I sent it to them. And I could tell just from, from looking over their website and their books that it was probably going to be a good fit. And it was. And it's been a wonderful experience um, working with them. Um, and they've been they've been very supportive and like a lot of small presses they may not have a lot of money to throw <laughs> behind things or in terms of marketing and so um i did you know i do a lot of that marketing work myself but i also feel like my connections with other writers and the the folks within my press my cohort um that really lift each other up and i think it's really important for writers um, to support other writers and in particular poets because i think um, there sometimes isn't as much support or as much money behind getting our work out into the world. And so I think whenever I can lift other poets up and help promote their work and they can help promote mine, um, that's where I really feel that, um, that yes, that I'm a literary citizen, that I'm a poet in the larger world. And um, I love championing the work of other poets and um, feel that I get that in return too. And that's, that's all I can ask for, you know, like I don't... Um, feel like I need to reach a gigantic audience, but I need to reach who hear, needs to hear my work. And I need to, to reach those folks who, who love poetry and who want, are curious about poetry, who want to engage with it. Um, and to me, being a literary citizen is um, not only participating by creating the art of literature, but also, yes, yeah, celebrating, lifting up, amplifying the voices of other writers. Um, so I do that not only just by word of mouth and social media, and you know whatever I can do to share the work of others. Um, but I also I have a, liter a little free library in my yard. I love sharing books with my community. Um, I have a poetry post, um, just ways to engage just those, even those passersby um, on a day when they might not have been expecting to engage with, with art or with literature. Um, so I love doing, doing things like that as well. And being involved in events and gatherings, whether it's readings or, um, or celebrations of book launches and um, those sorts of things. I love being engaged in that sort of work. So literary success to me. Um, doesn't look like getting rich. <laughs> um, it looks like um, finding good homes for my work with editors and presses that um, that value what I'm doing, that value um, the importance of uh, particularly poetry out in the world, um, and that um, 
that allow me to engage with and meet other other writers and readers um, to talk about my work. And ideally, you know, especially with this book um, and its subject matter, I really did want to also be using art to raise awareness and to um, hopefully inspire activism and get people involved and curious and, and to want to learn more. And so to me, that's what success is in terms of specifically of this book too, is, is being able to have those experiences with people out in the world. So, um, and in terms of advice for other writers, especially especially those just getting started, um, I'd say, you know, um, write as much as you can. <laughs> and remember that if you're not writing every day or if you're stuck, you're still a writer. And that can look like reading. That can take look like taking a walk and thinking about what you might want to work on. Um, that can look like just talking to, to other people about your work. Um, I highly recommend joining a, a critique group of some kind so you have other people who really get to know your work very deeply um, and can be mentors and sounding boards for you. Um, taking workshops with other writers to hone your craft, um, and then just engaging in the literary world by going to readings or open mics or, um, or talking with folks out there in the world. So um, that'd be my advice. So thanks so much for hanging out with me today um, and for listening to my work and being curious and engaged. And um, yeah, have a great day out there. Thank you.